I'll just give a little bit of an intro to Vince. Um, I'm sure most of you kind of are familiar with us as you found this, but um, VINS is a not-for-profit nature center in Cuiti, Vermont. And uh, we are doing these kind of, this virtual in connection with our Mammal Day event. So our Magnificent Mammal Day is tomorrow on campus. Um, and we are kind of having all these uh, local mammal groups come in and bring some native and exotic mammals to showcase. But we also were um, kind of excited by the things that we've learned in the past year about virtuals. Um, so definitely COVID-19 has affected so many people in so many awful ways, um, but it has also pushed us to learn new things. So um, virtual programming, virtual events um, is one of those things. And so we are very excited for being able to provide these kind of events, these virtual opportunities for people who aren't in Vermont or who can't come on campus, but they also really want to learn about wolves. And so um, keep an eye out for our next events and things. We have one coming up in a couple weeks. Our insect fest is happening and it also will have a virtual component to it. So we at VINS, we uh, want our mission really is to motivate people to care about their environment. And we think that um, education is part of our mission, also rehab, wild bird rehabilitation and research. And so you are here, part of our education, part of our mission. And uh, we hope that, you know, the more you know, the more you care. And so um, that's kind of Vin's in a little nutshell. And so we're really glad that you are supporting us all today by being part of this program, buying tickets, coming to campus. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we can always continue to provide these awesome opportunities to learn and engage and uh, see cool things um, through VINs. And so to start about, I'm gonna share my screen for a second and we're gonna talk about kind of Zoom etiquette during this, um, this program. So you guys are doing quite well right now. So good, good on you. Um, so to start, so, this program is going to be about the language of wolves. Um, uh, Dr. Cheryl Aza is going to be talking about that. She's done a lot of work with um, mammals for um, many, many years. And so she has a wealth of knowledge that we're really excited to tap into and learn. And so during the presentation, please remain muted unless um, we kind of call on you to ask a question. Um, and then uh, to ask questions, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little Q and I think just chat and then type in your chat. Uh, me and my colleague are going to be looking for those chats, those questions from you. Um, and we will save the really cool juicy ones for the end. Um, but any question that you have that's about kind of like clarification or needing to um, kind of um, make sure that Cheryl's kind of being understood. So if you have a question that's like, I, did, I just didn't understand what she just said there, please send a chat there with that and we will immediately try to uh, pause Cheryl <laughs> so that she can try to address those kind of questions. But any big, um, more concept questions, we're going to save for the end. Um, and also throughout the program, please feel free to use the reactions feature. So again, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see reactions. There's a heart, a thumbs up, and all these things that um, we can kind of gauge your reactions to things that she's saying, like Anna is now clapping um, and things like that. You can also raise your hand, but uh, we do prefer that you, um, you know, raise your hand for a question through the chat feature. You can also choose to turn your video off or on during the event. We are pinning the speaker. So I'm speaking right now. I'm the kind of the main focus. So I'm going to be seen. And then during the bulk of whenever Cheryl's talking, she's going to be seen. Um, so if your video is on, it'll only should be only seen when you're speaking. Um, and it will be recorded. So for, for future things, um, we're going to record this program. All right. So. Um, without further ado, we've had some minutes for everyone to kind of roll on in. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And so Cheryl can um, jump right into her um, program about the language of wolves. So thank you. Hi, it's uh, good to see everyone tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I want you to be able to see wolves. And... So is this, wait, 
it didn't go back to the beginning. Oh, I think that's because we looked through some slides in the beginning. All right, let's try this again. We'll get it. Okay. So uh, I was asked to talk about the language of wolves and what that probably makes people think about first is howling. There is this long profound association that we have with wolves and howling, but co <clears throat> communication in wolves is much more than that. And it's related very much to their social system. So I want to first go through just some basics of what the wolf social system is like and the context in which they need to communicate. So how, what that communication means for them. So wolves are very social animals. And most people I think have heard of wolf packs, but I'm not sure if you know what makes up a wolf pack. It's not just some group of wolves, it's a family. And we could actually think about it as a nuclear family. And that's nuclear family like with humans means a mom and a dad and their kids. Um, and those kids could be uh, from this year, like the image on the left, or it could be older ones that have stayed on in subsequent years and not dispersed. And the ones you see on the right are about yearlings, a uh, little under that, uh, but they may stay well past puberty, even when they're two or three or four years old, uh, kind of like human, Kids might stay home even after they get older. And it's often for the same kinds of reasons. Um, if there isn't, if there aren't suitable options for them out there in the habitat, uh, then they're not as likely to leave. They're more likely to stay home with their family. But also it really, it's, it's affected a lot by the tolerance of the parents, which also probably has parallels to humans. But wolves are also monogamous. Um, and that's an important feature because that means they basically mate for life. And if one of them does die or is killed for some reason, then um, they will accept another. But if uh, otherwise, they will stay together. And I want to point out that monogamy is really unusual for mammals. Um, it's very common for birds. I'm going to bring in bird. <laughs> Um, relations and references where I can, since uh, Z Vins, Vins is uh, sponsoring this. Um, so something like 90% of bird species are monogamous, but very few mammals. So wolves are also special in that way, and the bond is very close. And in fact, in field studies of wolves, um, even ones that are done with radio collars and uh, monitoring from airplanes, it's often possible to distinguish the mated pair in a particular area in a pack because they tend to stay very close together, uh, often moving together, sleeping near each other, and often in actual contact. So this whole family though, not just the, the mom and dad, the whole family forms a very close social bond. So they live together, but they also work together, and that means they hunt cooperatively. <clears throat> and this allows them to catch larger prey than they otherwise would be able to do. And they share then <clears throat> those kills among the family. So in the upper photo, you see there uh, a pack of wolves in Yellowstone that are <laughs> coming in on what we would call buffalo. They're actually called bison. Um, but uh, yeah, in the US, we usually say buffalo. In the lower left is uh, a pack of wolves that are going after a moose, again, a very large animal. And that's on Isle Royal, which is an island in Lake Superior where wolves have been studied since somewhere around 1960. So they have a, a lot of data and a lot of information from those interactions. But wolves also, as a family, defend a territory. <clears throat> and that territory is important for several reasons, but mostly, they're safeguarding their home, their food source, um, and wherever their dens are, they're defending that from other wolves that might be in the area. And there on the left, you can see a confrontation near a boundary between two wolf packs in Yellowstone. Um, but they also have to protect their puppies of the year. Other wolf packs, if ha they have access, would come into a, de a den and kill those puppies, so they need protection. 
So sociality then, this social system that wolves have makes communication really important. And that's both within the pack, but also with wolves that are outside the pack, other wolves that they might encounter. And so they have a number of ways uh, to do to that communication like we do. Uh, vision, so that's postures, that what we might call body language, uh, behavioral displays, but using sense of smell, so scent marking. Um, so that would be an active process, but even the scent glands on their bodies are releasing odor just passively. The wolf doesn't have to do something for that message to be broadcast. We don't know much about them using taste in communication. Um, it's confounded with smell because taste and smell are so closely linked. But we do suspect that taste is involved at least as an adjunct to sampling various odors uh, and other scent marks from other wolves. And of course, sound, those vocalizations like howls. And I'll go through each of these <clears throat> categories with examples in a moment. And then touch, um, I've already emphasized the importance of contact among them. And that can be though, either friendly or aggressive, depending on the context and the individuals involved. So starting with visual communication, uh, color patterns are important, especially color highlighting. So I wanna focus you on uh, these two wolves as the first example. And so look at the one on the left and uh, the ears. So they have upright ears, <laughs> unlike some dog breeds. And the fur on the inside of the ear um, is light, almost white, but there's a dark border <clears throat> of fur around the edge of the ears. So that helps highlight the ear shape and the ear position. Um, and then the skin around the eyes and the skin of the lips is black. And that contrasts with the fur around the eyes and the fur <clears throat> on the muzzle. And that shows up maybe a little bit better in the wolf on the right. But also the wolf on the right, you'll notice has a stripe across its shoulders. And that is a visual signal in a way, but it's going to be, you'll see even more important in a behavior that they show. The hairs in that area are longer than on most of the rest of the body. And so they can provide a visual signal. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But just think about you know, the, the colors and the contrasts and how that may emphasize various expressions or postures that they might take. So this is um, a couple of figures from a very old article from 1947, Schenkel, who was one of the first people to start looking, a scientist who started looking at these kinds of body postures. And I'm not gonna go through every one of these because some of them are you know, sort of unusual contexts and such, but I'll draw your attention to first, number one up in the upper left-hand corner. So there's a confident wolf, it's standing tall, it, but notice its tail is up. Uh, its ears are erect and forward. Its neck is upright. So it's standing nice and tall and looking confident. And that might grade into aggression. Uh, again, that stiff, rigid, upward stance. But then look down toward the bottom, nine, ten, those numbers 9, 10, and 11, and those wolves are more submissive. They're more defensive. And notice they're crouching. The tail is down. And in fact, in number 11, the tail is actually between its back legs. So that's sort of the, the most passive it can become. Its ears are not upright. The ears are either back or to the sides. And so those, those postures send messages to other wolves. And then to the right, you see there's um, a sort of sub figure that just pulls out the tail positions from that same figure to emphasize the importance of whether the tail is upright, whether it's relaxed and hanging loose. You can't see the situations where the tail might actually be wagging a little bit, but that is sometimes used. But then that extreme of the tail then tucked between the back legs in that most submissive stance. And then this figure focuses on the face and how that highlighting of the colors can emphasize 
the positions and the express the positions, especially of the ears and the expression on the face. So starting from the bottom left is a just relaxed alert posture. So that's a relaxed wolf, just you know, ears up, looking uh, confident, but not in and not being necessarily aggressive or defensive. Uh, but then as you go up, the one in the top left. Uh, notice the, the lips that are pulled back. Sometimes that's even called like a submissive grin. A more submissive wolf will pull its lips back like that. But then as you move to the right, you see the muzzle start to crinkle. And that's as the, the lips are still pulled back, but the teeth are beginning to show, the ears are pulled back, and that wolf might be growling a little bit. And then down in the further furthest right-hand corner at the bottom, is the most aggressive stance. So that wolf is more aggressive and is likely a dominant wolf. Ears are upright, forward a little bit, and notice the lips aren't pulled back in that submissive grin. The lips are wrinkled forward. So the canine teeth can show, uh, and the muzzle is wrinkled, mostly because those upper lips are being pulled up to reveal the teeth. So now there are wolves of other colors. Uh, white wolves are common in Alaska. And so that the color contrasts on the face are not as obvious, but notice there still is black skin around the eyes. There's still black skin on the mouth. So those will still show. And there's a little bit of a dark border around the edge of the ears. So there still is some contrasting color that will help show expression. But the black wolf, the only contrast you see are the eyes. But there's something different about black wolves. Uh, in 2009, a study was published that showed, uh, a genetic study that showed that the black coat color may not be natural for wolves. And by natural, I mean not selected uh, in the normal sort of evolutionary selective way. Uh, but it looks like that comes, that black coat color comes from hybridization at some time in the past with domestic dogs. So the take home message might be that completely black wolves didn't evolve to be like that and maybe at some disadvantage in communicating with other wolves in the pack. But if you do look at black wolves that are out there, many of them aren't really completely black. Um, they still have some highlighting like this uh, image on the right shows. So now I have so, just some um, images of real wolves doing those behaviors. Uh, and so these are a couple of pairs of wolves in the classic dominant and submissive postures. So there on the left, uh, I mean, look at the ears, the position of the ears of the wolf that's standing, look at his tail uh, and uh, he's looking down at the other, and then the other one crouched all the way down on the ground with the head then looking up and licking at the muzzle of the wolf that's standing on the right. That wolf has uh, not just crouched down, but is rolling over on its back to expose its tummy. And that is the most vulnerable, vulnerable position it can be in. So it is then making itself vul vulnerable to and showing submission to the more dominant wolf standing over it. And then a couple of images of contrasting facial expressions. So on the left is a relaxed and alert face. So this is a confident wolf, but it's not showing any fear or aggression. But the one on the right uh, would be classified as fear aggression and not overt like dominant aggression because notice its ears are off to the side, not in an upright posture. And the lips are pulled back a little bit, but there is that wrinkled nose and it is feeling some fear aggression is what we would judge from that picture. But on a less aggressive <laughs> note, Wolves also use play bows uh, just like dogs do. And so you may have seen uh, your dog or other dogs in a, a dog park uh, in a play bow posture. So wolves can also be play, playful, not just aggressive as so many pictures will show you. Okay, so that 
that wraps up the introduction to vision. So now we're going to look at olfactory communication, and that's sort of the fancy way of talking about scent. So communicating by sense of smell. And the most well-known, the most familiar to you, uh, because you probably have all seen dogs doing things, even if you don't own a dog, uh, but this male wolf is urine marking. So he's raising his legs, so that's called a raised leg urination uh, on that tree and depositing some urine. And urine marks contain actually a lot of information and you may not have thought about what they might mean, although you've probably seen male dogs urine mark, uh, but there's information in that mark that's kind of like a fingerprint, um, and it gives the information about who that individual is. It's ident individual identification. It's gender, that is whether it's male or female. It's reproductive condition, so is it past puberty or is this during breeding season? And then how old that mark might be. And that's, I think, an interesting uh, feature as well because any scent mark and urine uh, in particular has a lot of different components. And those different chemical components evaporate at different rates. So a mark that's just placed will actually have different concentrations of those components relative to each other than a mark that's been there aging because as it gets older, some of the components will evaporate and be gone uh, sooner than others. So we think that, the, that wolves can actually judge the age of a mark, how long ago that mark was placed. Uh, but something else that's I, I, interesting, especially relative to dogs, is that only the dominant male in a pack of wolves will raise its leg to urine mark. So that dominant male is the dad. Um, so if an exception to that occurs, if one of the younger males, one of his sons decides to challenge him, maybe he's gotten old and he's not as strong as he used to be and the son is young and strong and vigorous and sometimes sons will challenge their dads like that. And one of the first signs of that challenging is that young male will raise his leg to urinate. That, the, the, the dad doesn't even have to go sniff what's in that urine. If he sees that son of his raise his leg to urinate, he'll run over to it and see that as a challenge and there might be a fight that ensues. So there's a really strong visual signal in that raised leg as well as the olfactory signal of the urine mark being left. So a take home message from this might be, thinking of dogs, is that most male dogs seem to think they're dominant, right? Because almost all male dogs raise their legs to urinate. Okay, this is one of my favorite images. So dogs in love. This is a print. I actually own this print. Um, I bought it uh, here in Vermont. Doug Knapp is an artist in Burlington. So he does great drawings like this. And the caption, as you can see, I got your P-mail yesterday, but they wouldn't let me out last night. Uh, and that's so fitting for anyone who works with dogs or any of the other wild canids. Uh, when you talk about breeding season communication between males and females. So I've already mentioned male wolves, urine marking, raising their legs, uh, but during the breeding season, female wolves will also urine mark. And they do that a little differently because they're anatomically different. So in this female, uh, if you look closely, her back right foot is raised off the ground a little bit. So that's as subtle as it is. If you're not in the right position when you're observing, you don't necessarily see that happen. So she's squatting, but she's raised that one foot a little bit and she's directing the urine in a particular place. She's marking. Um, and some, some female dogs will do that. I've had a female dog that did urine mark. Uh, so it, it happens in dogs as well, but it's not common. But an, an, another important point for this breeding season um, feature is that the, a mated pair, a male-female pair, will urine mark over each other's marks. So it's really likely 
that as soon as this female stands up and moves away, her male partner will come right over, sniff that place and urine mark over it. And so we think, and there's evidence that actually ind indicates that he's claiming her by doing that. Because if these marks are left around territory boundaries, then other males that sniff that, oh, here's a female that's maybe coming into estrus and maybe wanting to mate, by having male urine mixed in with her mark, it's signaling to other males that basically she's taken. And there have been experiments that have done urine presentations like that and looked at responses. And it looks like that actually is the message, which I think is kind of cool. So marking, um, you more likely have heard about marking territory. We even refer to domestic dogs about marking their territory. And so there on the right, uh, in this again is an image from Isle Royal. And you can maybe see the yellow snow spot <laughs> where that that wolf is sniffing. So wolves on Isle Royal and in Northern Minnesota have been documented doing territorial marking. So the image on the left is a diagram from a study that was done in Superior National Forest, which is uh, Northern Minnesota, where Dave Meech has been studying wolves for, well, as you can see, since at least 1975 um, and even before that. So what they found was if you, every one of the dots, every one of the colored dots is a urine mark that they documented the place of. And the different colors represent urine marks from different packs. So the center one, the red marks, that's the, the center pack that they're looking at primarily. And you can see most of the urine marks are around the periphery of the territory. They're doing some in the middle, <clears throat> but almost all of them are concentrated around the outside. But also notice that the uh, abutting territories come right up to the boundary and maybe cross over just a little bit, but those territories are basically exclusive. So this is a really good example of how territory marking, at least in wolves, I don't think it works that well in dogs, <laughs> uh, given the way we keep dogs and the way we walk them and what our yards are like and such. But for wolves, territory marking does actually seem to send a message to other wolves to stay away, that, that that territory is claimed. Okay, anal gland secretion. So this is not nearly so pretty. If you've heard about <laughs> anal glands or anal sacs, it's probably because your dog had impacted or infected anal sacs. And this is pretty common in dogs, but I don't know of a single case in wolves. I can't say it's never happened, but I've worked with wolves for a really long time, since 1981, and I've never heard of, of this problem in wolves. So this seems to be a domestic dog problem. Um, but the image on the right is common to dogs and wolves. So sniffing the anal area, this is a really common greeting ceremony. Again, you may have seen this in dog parks. Um, so there are other sources of odor back there, which you can imagine, uh, but anal glands may contribute to that as well, that profile. Oh, and here's my dog's face right, right up here and beside me, my wolfy looking dog. Um, okay, wolves also have scent glands between their paw pads. And so this leaves a passive mark as they walk but the wolf on the right is scratching. And this is something you might see a domestic dog do too. After urinating or defecating, especially males will then do this sort of stiff legged scratching. And so this is also, we think, putting down more foot odor, but scratching might also draw attention to the place where the urine or feces were de deposited. And a clarification, the pads themselves have sweat glands, but uh, at least to date, we don't have any evidence that those, scent, those sweat glands leave any smell. It's the glands between the pads that we have evidence actually have a scent that they're putting down. Okay, so raised hackles. So I mentioned the long hair on, on the shoulders of wolves. 
And so you've probably heard of hackles or you've seen dogs raise their hackles. So this is clearly a visual signal. Uh, and it, it typically is associated with a dog that's aroused and maybe is feeling aggressive. And from the side, those raised hackles make the wolf look bigger. But the other, to me, much more interesting thing is that there are scent glands at the base of all those hair follicles uh, across the shoulders and down the back. So raising the hackles actually releases scent from those glands. The skin is folded at the base of each hair follicle. And when the, the, the hair is raised, it actually opens the access to those scent glands and it can be then wafted into the air. So a wolf or a dog that raises its hackles is also sending an olfactory message as well as this visual signal that says it might be feeling aggressive. And then there's rolling in something smelly. And anyone who's owned a dog has probably experienced this at some time. My son's dog loves rolling in stinky stuff and he's having to bathe her all the time. So there haven't been any definitive studies about what this means. Clearly from these two images, you see that wolves do this too. But the hypothesis, hypothesis that I like best is that the wolf is actually covering itself, its neck and shoulders, with a very pungent non-wolfy smell. And so that, that hypothesis says it's trying, the wolf is actually trying to disguise its own wolfy scent so that when it's hunting, it's less likely to be detected by prey. So if they're you know, uh, going after deer and they you know, uh, haven't come out in the open and started running yet, but they're sort of pacing along beside and the deer haven't seen them yet, maybe the deer aren't gonna realize it's a wolf because it's just smelling, oh, there's a dead something over there and dead somethings aren't a threat. But we don't have definitive proof of this. This is just my favorite hypothesis of the ones that are out there. Okay, communication by touch. So wolves do like to be in contact uh, and touch can be a friendly or an aggressive interaction. So wolf parents can be incredibly tolerant. I've seen wolf pups crawling all over parents and even on you know, the older uh, siblings and chewing on ears, chewing on nose, chewing, chewing on toes, whatever, the parents are really tolerant. But the parents will also use discipline if they think the kids are getting out of line, even if it's an adult kid getting out of line. So what this wolf on the right, and what I think it's doing, I didn't take this picture, so I'm not sure, but I've seen this behavior a lot, is the adult will pin the, the, sub, the, the subordinate or younger wolf, pin it with its muzzle, and it's not biting, it's not trying to do damage. It's using its mouth to hold the other wolf down and base and growling and basically saying, wait, what you did is not acceptable behavior, young man or whatever, um, and that's a way of, of showing discipline. But wolves are also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, very playful and certainly puppies, but even among adults, but among adults, especially during courtship, play is one of the components, uh, early components of courtship between a male and female. And then on the right, um, there's something a little more potentially aggressive going on. Uh, and there's probably, uh, in addition to the visual message being sent, something auditory, probably some growling going on. Um, but the touch I want to draw your attention to at that moment is the tongue. So the, it's licking the nose of the other. And then that leads me to talk about this greeting ceremony. So pups, when the adults return to the, the den area after they've been hunting, they bring food back to the den in their stomachs. Rather than carry it in their mouths, they actually wolf it down. And there is documented uh, proof, evidence from field studies of a male wolf carrying 20 pounds of meat in its stomach back to the den. So it's an efficient way to carry. You're not bogged down with having something hanging out of your mouth, but, and so it's partially chewed. So they get back to the den 
And the kids will then lick at the parent's mouth like this. It's a greeting, but that also stimulates the parents or older brothers and sisters to regurgitate that meat for them. So regurgitate sounds awful, but this is pretty fresh. They've just swallowed it at the kill, run back to the den, and now they're giving it to the kids. And so here, again, I've added a little bird note on the side. So this is from a classic textbook by uh, John Alcock, an animal behavior textbook, and uh, of a, a study done ages ago of a gull chick, looking at what it is that makes a gull chick peck at the beak of the parent, and then the parent will cough up some food for the chick. And so there's a spot, a red spot on the parent's beak that stimulates the chick to peck at that spot and then the parent releases food to it. So it's a similar kind of greeting ceremony when the parent gull comes back to the nest as when the parent wolf comes back to the den. We've got another bird parallel here. And then of course, cuddling. Uh, there's a lot of very positive affiliative contact and especially for pups that provides comfort and warmth, but for all of the wolves, it also helps strengthen their social bonds. Okay, vocalization, the next topic. Howling is what we know best, of course, which helps pack members stay in contact. Uh, if they get separated, it warns other wolves that there's a pack present in this territory when they all howl together. And often before they go off on a hunting foray, they will howl together. And that's been sometimes likened to something like a pep rally to get them all ready to go out hunting. But pups, as soon as they come out of the den at about three weeks of age, will join in those howls. So they seem to be hardwired to howl. Other vocalizations, and there are a lot of minor ones, especially having to do with puppies in the den, but the main ones that I'm focusing on and the main ones that, uh, that occur and that we know about growling, of course, uh, growling and snarling, um, and then whining. Uh, again, that's often puppies, but it's also submissive of wolves will whine. Barking is not nearly as common in wolves as it is in dogs, although in wolves it tends to happen when they're protecting a den site. If they've got puppies at the den and if there's an, they perceive an intruder, they're more likely to bark in that kind of circumstance. So again, uh, this, I think this may be my last bird uh, link, but interspecies communications. I've only been talking about wolves communicating with each other, uh, but ravens and wolves have a long history. <laughs> There have been a lot of things written about uh, people, biologists and non-biologists, seeing ravens around wolves, and they do seem to be in proximity a lot. And they've been, ravens have been observed, what people think from the context, actually leading wolves to prey, as if the raven knows that if the wolf kills that deer or whatever it is, that the ravens get a chance to share that carcass. And it happens often enough. This, we can't know what the intent is and how well the ravens are predicting what the wolf will do or if the, rape of the wolf really knows the raven is leading it to deer. But if you think about it, the ravens are up in the air. They can see much further away to know whether there might be a deer or an elk or something that's worth going after. So maybe there really is something, something to that story. And then this picture from Yellowstone shows some magpies getting in on the action as well. But I don't know of any stories about magpies leading wolves to a, a, to a, a kill. Um, that's just a raven story. So how does, you were promised this in the teaser that how does all this apply to your dog? Well, wolves, um, and the species name is Canis lupus, are the wild ancestor of all domestic dogs. And it is now believed that dogs are a subspecies of wolf, not a separate species. So dog is, used to be Canis familiaris, dog is now Canis lupus familiaris, so a subspecies of the wolf. And so the, uh, the conjecture is that wolves early on might have helped humans find prey, helped them hunt. 
And over the years, of course, we have dogs that do all kinds of jobs for us. But nowadays, most of us have dogs as companions, right? Not as workers. But how much are dogs really like their wolf ancestors? There's not an easy answer to that. And if you look at this chart, this doesn't even show the full uh, scope of the differences among current dog breeds. There are so many different sizes, shapes, colors. But <laughs> if we go back to uh, the earlier ideas that I was showing you and the images of wolf facial expressions and wolf communication, well, wolves are most like the Arctic breeds, and that would be things like Huskies and Malamutes and even uh, Spitz and Norwegian Elkhounds, uh, dogs like that. Those are the Arctic breeds. Um, and they have highlighting that is pretty similar to wolves. And German Shepherds aren't Arctic breeds, but they do have a lot of features in common with wolves. People often think about Shepherds uh, as looking like wolves and often cross wolves with Shepherds. Uh, but the picture in the upper left hand corner, and I'm not sure what the little white dog is because I don't know small dogs well. I have a German Shepherd, um, but you can see that's a really different animal. That doesn't, in fact, if you didn't already know that was a dog, and if I hadn't already told you that all dogs descended originally from wolves, you might not believe those were the same species or related much at all. Um, so reminding you again, all these sizes and shapes and colors and color patterns. So the features of some dog breeds must make communication more difficult. So floppy ears, they can't give ear signals uh, with ears like that, and it probably impedes hearing a bit as well. Curled tails, well, that tail is, it's not even upright, it's curled. So it's not even that it's got a permanently upright tail that's always saying I'm dominant. It's hard to know what that message is. And then the, uh, the little pug on the right with the, some people call that a squashed in face. Um, that's a problem in a number of ways when it comes to communication. First, it's hard for that face to show the range of facial expressions that we've seen for wolves. Uh, some of that is just because of the shape and some of it because of the lack of color contrast, but also the olfactory epithelium in that muzzle is not as expansive as it is in a dog with a longer muzzle. So I would bet its sense of smell is not as good either. But there are some behaviors that are the same. So. This very optimistic little pup in the lower left hand corner is play bowing to a cat. I'm not sure that's going to turn out well, but that is a classic play bow. Um, and then, of course, the dog in the middle lifting his leg very high to leave a very high urine mark. And then, of course, this classic dog park sniffing each other's behinds, um, common for wolves and for dogs. So that's the end of the slides that I have about wolves and wolf communication. Uh, but Caitlin had asked me, because there may be some of you that are watching that are trying to decide sort of what to do with yourself professionally, and you would be interested in what kind of training I had to have or what kind of experience I had to get me to the point where I could work with wolves and have all of this time with wolves. So I have a couple of slides on career path, uh, just to tell you my background. So I uh, went to the University of Wisconsin. So I'm a Midwesterner originally, and my undergraduate degrees are in psychology, which is animal behavior in this case, not clinical psychology or human psychology, but animal behavior and in zoology. So the sort of all about animals. And then I stayed on to do a PhD in endocrinology and reproductive physiology. Um, and my interest all along has been the interplay between physiology and behavior and how that links to adaptation to the environment, sort of the behavioral ecology. But my dissertation in Wisconsin was on the domestic horse and the interplay between reproductive physiology and behavior. So I got a very different start from wolves. 
Uh, but I was lucky enough to be able to do postdoctoral research on Wolf olfactory communication at the University of Minnesota then with David Meech. Um, I have done field work uh, a few times. So in Peru, I worked with Saturan desert foxes doing just sort of classic behavioral ecology, radio collared foxes, looking at activity budgets, when they hunted, when they were active, diet, what they were eating, that sort of thing. And in uh, Nevada, I was on a contract with the Bureau of Land Management because of the horse work I had done uh, at, for my PhD on feral horse. And feral horses are, some people call them wild horses. Those are domestic horses that have now reverted to the wild state and are living in the wild. And so the Bureau of Land Management has a lot of trouble controlling horse numbers. So in fact, to this day, I'm still involved in advising on measures for perhaps doing that by fertility control rather than removing horses from the range. And then the experience I had on the, the California Channel Islands was that we were on the islands, but what was interesting is that there had been a crash in the island fox population numbers and they didn't want to bring the foxes to the mainland because of quarantine restrictions and such, but they captured the remaining foxes, which was down to three on one island and is at 15 on another island. And they wanted to create a captive breeding program. So while the veterinarians and ecologists were figuring out what had caused these population crashes on three of the six islands, um, they wanted the captive breeding program to increase the number of foxes that could then be released. So I was in charge of managing the captive breeding component of that recovery. So it was captive breeding, but it was in the field, you know, right where the foxes uh, would live. And those foxes did recover. They've been released. They're back in the wild. And that was the talk I gave at VINS two years ago for Mammal Day. Um, but then I spent the rest of my career for almost 30 years doing endangered species research and captive breeding. So because of my interest in physiology, I need to get my hands on animals now and then. And it turned out that zoos are a good way to do that, at least good zoos that have research programs. So St. Louis Zoo hired me to create a research program and I could do it any way I wanted. So I made one for behavioral and reproductive sciences and I stayed there for almost 30 years. And I also set up a reproductive management center that was for the entire North America. So the Associ Association of Zoos and Aquariums is the professional accrediting body in North America for zoos. Um, and then um, five years ago in 2016, I retired to Norwich, Vermont because I really wanted to live in Vermont and I didn't want to be an administrator anymore. I wanted to be a biologist uh, again. So I'd still do work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service in their Mexican wolf recovery program, especially during the breeding season. Uh, but at the zoo, even though I worked with everything from reptiles and birds to mammals, um, the species that I seem to have been associated with my whole career and that I get invited to still be on advisory groups for and such are equids, so horses, zebras, and asses, um, and then canids like wolves. Uh, so I think, yes, yeah, so that's the end of my any animal slides. And this is to open for questions if you have any, and depending on how much time is left. And this, this proportion of questions to answers, I don't want that to look like I don't have any answers, but it really is, especially for any of you who are thinking of going into science. Anytime a scientist comes out of a research project, you typically feel like, okay, well, you answered some questions, but you encountered so many more. There's just so much we don't know yet, especially in biology. So I tell young people that are starting out in the profession, look at this as job insurance. There's so much left that we don't know yet, that questions that need to be answered. But if you have questions about what I've covered tonight, I'd be happy to try to answer them. So thank you. Right. We got some, some clapping.
Great. Should I just get out of screen sharing now then? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. Let's see. Well, I, I have an odd question. Um, so my question is, so the age of Mark, you had mentioned that there's, um, there's this, so when they urinate, there's like, they can capt how old it is. And you're saying that there's a good chance that they're actually understanding that. Do have we seen them react differently to different ages of the marks? Like if it's a fresh one, they'll like react to it more strongly. Um, if it's like a competitor or something like that, yeah. or is that how they kind of understand that they they probably are capping that? It's a really good question, and I don't have a complete answer. So there have been a lot of studies, actually more with foxes than with wolves although we've done some of it with wolves too, with trying to uh, do chemical composition of urine marks and of various glandular secretions to see what the chemical components are and what their, uh, their concentrations are in a fresh mark and then look at how they differentially evaporate. And you, you can tell that also by their molecular size. Mm -hmm. So a small molecule will evaporate faster than a larger, heavier molecule. Um, but the circumstantial evidence that's strongest, I think, is that if you, and you could do this with a dog as well, but with wolves, they'll go back and sniff where they've urinated before as if they're judging whether they need to mark over it again. And you can see how it would be important that they refresh that regularly, but it's undoubted that the message changes over time because of differential volatility of the chemicals that are in that, that urine mark. But we don't know, we can't ask them, well, what does this smell like to you? I mean, nobody's come up with that critical experiment that would give us that information. Great. So I see the question from Anna. Yes, and I don't think I was clear enough on that. What I get, what I told you was absolutely correct, <laughs> I contend. But in the old days, and some people still do that, they use the term alpha wolf. And that gives the impression, and I think it comes from early wolf work where people had captive wolves and they just assembled wolves. They just put wolves together and watched behavior and described behavior. And some of that behavior was wolves vying for dominance and whoever won, then they said was alpha, the Greek you know, letter for A number one. Um, but because we know this is actually, in, in, the, in the real world, a wolf pack is a family and there may be an unrelated wolf now and then, but it's not common, the typical, is an, as, as a family um, that Dave Meech started saying, oh, 10 years ago or so, that we really shouldn't be using the term alpha because that suggests something different in the hierarchy. It doesn't make it as clear that, but of course, parents should be dominant to their kids, right? There's something wrong if they're not dominant to their kids. Um, so to say a dominant wolf has meaning but alpha does have another connotation. So uh, those of us in the wolf world are trying to get people away from thinking about alpha wolf as if this is just some random assortment of wolves that duke it out to see who's alpha. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, all right, last chance for questions. Perfect. Well, that was really, really awesome, Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, we got to thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you again so much all, for everyone who attended and um, is supporting VINs. Um, I hope you guys have a great day. And if you're making it to Mammal Day tomorrow, that's awesome. Um, and uh, thank you all so much. Bye, thank you. You're welcome. Bye.